Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Beasley Allen plaintiff attorney Lee O'Dell sits down with clients Mary Ann Bingary, Deborah Smith, and Laura Stahl as they each detail their battles with cancer after using Johnson & Johnson talcum powder. Well, good morning, ladies. Thank you so much for being here with me. How are we today? Great. Great. Thank you for Beautiful. having us. Um, I don't know that we've ever had better looking guests, no offense to our, um, our past <laughs> guests, but let's, um, we could just all start and, and, uh, and shine a little bit. Um, but let's start uh, with you, Lee. Uh, I know that you uh, have done some great work and of course the fight is still going on, um, but can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to, um, to work on this case uh, against J&J? Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. I am so privileged to have... Um, really what I would say is a role of a lifetime to represent wonderful women and their families like Marianne, Deborah, Laura. I mean, what a great calling to be able to stand in the gap for them. And I, along with others here at Beasley Allen, have been working on this case for more than 10 years. Um, we have tried um, numerous cases around the country, uh, really been involved from the ground up showing and demonstrating that J&J &J has known their product causes ovarian cancer uh, and mesothelioma for um, decades and failed to tell those of us who've trusted them. And and so it's been a privilege and I've, uh, my main role is serving as co-lead counsel in the multi-district litigation, which is the federal litigation. And um, we have been fighting a long time, but we are committed to continue this fight until um, women like my friends on the phone here and their families receive just compensation. Yes. Well, thank you for that work and, and um, what an incredible leadership role. Uh, so excited to continue to watch mm -hmm. what you do and, and the incredible changes that you're making and, and how meaningful it is, not just for all of our, our guests here, but for their families, their loved ones, and uh, you know, for even those people who are not part of the litigation, because I'm, I'm sure it's touched us um, each in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to start. Uh, I don't, I'm going to start with Deborah, just because you're wearing pink, and it just so happens to be my signature <laughs> color. Um, but if, don't take offense, Deborah. Thanks so much. So glad that you can be here. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about your journey? Um, you know, I guess you know. Clearly, you use the product, um, and how it has this. You know, being a part of this and, and becoming ill has has changed your life. Um, yeah, so I used the product for a very long time from my teenage years up until my adult years. And for anybody who lives in the South, know that it gets very hot and humid here. And the last thing you want to do is be sweaty and stuff. So, you know, I use that to keep dry and everything. But, um, when I found out the way I found out I had cancer, I was going, I was in the hospital to have, you know, minor surgery for something else. And while they had me on the table, the doctor came in and told my husband, she said, I just wanted to let you know, you know, while we have her on the table, we found a cyst on her ovary and we believe it's cancer. You know, we can go ahead and remove that. And they were, you know, talking about, um, we suggest that we go ahead and do, you know, a hysterectomy and everything and make sure everything is, you know, nothing had spread or anything like that. But at the time, me and my husband were planning on expanding our family. So he's like, well, do we have time? I really don't want to make that decision from my wife just in case, you know, it was something that could be removed and it wasn't serious. You know, then he made that decision, but he said, no, I'm not going to make that decision without her. You know, but do we have time? So they were like, yeah, well, we have time. We have a little bit of time, you know, for you guys to talk it over. So we ended up doing that. And um, in the process of, I say, about a month, I think I haven't even healed up for a month. I had to go back to have surgery because it, it, it came back. It was starting to grow back. Hmm. Well, so I, I want to interrupt you for a minute. Just mm -hmm. like what an incredible 
incredibly awful position for your husband to be in, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, there, there's the stress on you. I, I, I can't even speak to it because I'm not part of it, but to have to be put in that position um, mm-hmm. at a time when you're trying to grow your family, I mean, it's just, that's just devastating. Um, yeah. And clearly it, it, you know, I came back and, um, uh, you know, how, how has it been since then? I mean, it's drastic change to your life, right? Um, I went from being, uh, cause at the time before all, all the cancer stuff, I was like working out, I was in boot camp, and you know, it's just a regular, healthy, normal person. But after that, it's like everything just totally changed. I had to go from being that healthy person to, um, having to go through chemo losing my hair and just my whole health just spiraled out of control. It's like when I was doing chemo, it's like the, I guess the medicine and stuff that they use, it just wreaks havoc on your body. Thank God I only had to do three chemo treatments, but that was strong enough to do some damage. So I went from having all kinds of health issues stemming from that, that I never had before. And I remember talking to the doctor and he said, well, when you, you know, you have chemo, you're going to lose some hair, you know, and at the time I had, you know, a thick head of hair. So it was like, it wasn't like, you know, it just, it started coming out. But when it, it did come out, I was, I remember being at work and I said, you know, my head is itching, you know, real bad. I'm sitting up there scratching my head and all of a sudden I felt my hand slip. And when I looked at my hand, I had a clump of hair and then I jumped up and I was like, Oh my goodness, did anybody see that? You know, but thank God my coworkers didn't see that. I said, Well, excuse me, I'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick and I'm just doing and I remember my hair was just coming out. But thank God it was thick enough that it wasn't noticeable, you know, but then after a while it got to a point where I could just sit there and just do like this and just like handfuls would come out. And I remember my daughter sitting down, she's Oh my god, mommy, your hair is coming out and she just me and her just sat there. And we were just, I had a bag and we were just taking it, taking it out and putting it in the bag. And so all of it was just gone. And um, it's not like you, you, the doctors tell you to expect that, but when it, you know, and you're saying, okay, I know what's going to happen. But when it actually does happen, it's like, wow, you know, I didn't think it was going to be this bad. And I remember my husband, you know, shaving his head. He said, well, I was crying. He's like, you know what? Well, until your hair goes back, I'm going to shave all mine off, you know, and then when yours go, it'll grow back together. But I've got chills. Than, I've got goosebumps. Me too. Yeah, that was sweet of him because most guys, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I'm not going to cut my yeah. hair off. <laughs> <laughs> he, he shaved it completely bald. And then as it started growing back, you know, he let his grow back. But it still hasn't come back the way that I, you know, thought it would. So right. that was another thing. That was a big disappointment, too, because, um, and then during that time, I was on so much medicine that I have never had to take. I had like a box yeah. with all different kinds of stuff. Medicine yeah. for this, medicine for that, pills for this, pills for that. And I was like, my God, I never had to take this much stuff before. Right. And, and that, sudden, what a drastic change, right? From this health, mm-hmm. like you said, this healthy person to all of a sudden needing a box of medicine. I've seen a lot of head nodding. Um, Lauren, mm-hmm. tell, tell but obviously you can relate to some of that. Um, I can. Um, I was a mom of three, married for about 10 years, and uh, went in with some pain and discomfort and nausea that was never going away. And it all happened within about six months. And um was told that I was possibly pregnant, went in for an ultrasound the next day and they found a mass about this big on one ovary and then two smaller ones. And um, they called me, I was at home making the beds in our little girl's room and doing housework and told my oncologist and my uh, gynecologist were on the phone together. We did a meeting call and her, my husband was at work and he told me that they that I had ovarian cancer. Um, my CA-125 was 800 and some, I can't even remember. I was really sick 
I was working as a supervisor for a collections company and sleeping during my lunch breaks and during my breaks, not like me at all. When in, after I found out and they called us and we consulted and my husband and I cried, which it's so emotional. Um, and this has been 20 some years. Um, we decided to go through with the surgery the next day and I had a complete hysterectomy, ovaries, um, part of my cervix, uterus, all the structure, lymph nodes in my tummy. Uh, the surgeon came out, the oncologist, and he told her during the surgery that he thought that they had gotten everything. Thank you, God, for that. Uh, it was a blessing. So I didn't have to do chemotherapy, but I did hormone therapy. And I healed up and I went home and continued my life um, with my three little girls. We were not allowed to have any more children. Our lives were stopped at that point of becoming parents any longer. As you said, Deborah, it was a situation where we may have wanted more kids. We were still young and uh, just went through a lot, a lot of treat, uh, going in for blood testing and you know, the whole realm, uh, getting down to that point where you can say you're cancer free. And I blame Johnson and Johnson for this. I used talcum powder from the time I was 18 until mm -hmm. which would have been in the early late 70s that was a staple in our home mm -hmm. uh you got mm -hmm. out of the shower there was five girls dad everybody had it and we used it and you wanted to be fresh like you said you wanted to use it and i never thought that i was ever going to be in a position where there would be a carcinogen in a product that i'm using and the company that i'm buying it from is willing to not take responsibility for this. So mm -hmm. the PSTD from having the cancer was enough for me. It is lifelong, as you girls know, you never get over it. You wait for the next shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, you wait for the next time they're gonna tell you you have cancer. And it doesn't matter how long the time goes by. And uh, I want them held responsible. The Texas two-step is not working for me. It's mm -hmm. not an answer. It's right. not the way this should happen. They have millions and billions of dollars. And there are people, girls and individuals like us, not to keep going, but they are not even with us anymore. And their husbands and their kids and their grandkids are living without them. And I blame Johnson & Johnson. I blame them for this. And they should pay the price. I want to be here for my kids and my grandkids and my husband of 32 years for a long time, but you just never know. And I think they should compensate. I think I should not have to worry about going through early onset menopause at 31 years old, osteoporosis because of the fact of have, uh, having bone loss because of early onset menopause, hair loss, not being able to take any type of uh, synthetic hormone because I am a cancer survivor and I may get it again because of a, 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 a synthetic hormone. That was what, that's where I'm at. Right, and, and, and I'm, thank you for sharing it. I know, I know it's Thanks not for easy. Listening. Um, very much so. I mean, I think, you know, some of the things you're talking about I think people maybe generally might understand, but a lot of people don't understand that it's lifelong, that mm -hmm. that feeling of, like you said, waiting yeah. for the other shoe to drop. So is it safe to say that every time you go to the doctor or have something wrong, there's a fear? Is it still there? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Every day. Yeah. Every, every, yeah, every little twinge of pain or something, you feel, you think, oh my God, yeah. is it? And then when you go to the doctor, it's like if I go for a mammogram or my annual gynecologist, yeah. I'm like, is there, are they going to find anything or are they going to say something's wrong? It's, it's, yes. I mean, it's Marianne, really emotional. It, yeah, well, it there's, and, and we can talk about that. I want to give Marianne a chance, but also that, you know, there's, a, it's not just physiological, right? There's a lot of emotional and mental mm -hmm. uh, effects that this has. Marianne, I've, I see you nodding. Of course, yeah. you know, some, some of this must be similar to you, but but tell me a little bit about uh, about how this has affected you, please. Um, well, I I'm sorry, I get emotional. Oh, and, and 
I understand. Let, let me, let me interrupt oh, for a moment. Okay. You can take your time and you still look beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. I am, I'm blessed. Um, my mother is a breast cancer survivor two times. Um, and so I haven't been there for your lives. I understand it's very different. I understand as a daughter, I watched my mom go through chemo. I watched her go through surgery and, you know, she tried to like, like, she's like, I'm fine. I'm totally fine. I, I, and we laugh about it now because there's nothing else to do. I went wig shopping with her. Um, so I'm hearing what you're saying and I wish I could just jump through and hug you um, because the strength that my mother has, I see it in all of you um, and your attorney, <laughs> right? You, you are, you are at the, the front lines, um, but I, I know it's difficult. <laughs> No matter how long ago it's been. I was diagnosed um, in 2008 with stage four ovarian cancer. Um, I'm still here. Um, and um, uh, I was experiencing, you know, typical female stuff. You know, the, the, the uh, weight gain, back pain, you know, swelling, you know, in the stomach, that kind of a thing. You know, you think nothing of it, you know, uh, bowel issues and whatever. You think nothing of it. But then it got to a point where the back was pain was really getting to me. And so I went to the um, gynecologist and found out um, that I had uh, a, the tumor. And I did surgery, and the tumor was the size of a cantaloupe. All right. So it's the thing is, um, I didn't have a total hysterectomy then. I had a total hysterectomy in the 80s, and I still got it, which the oncologist said was rare. It does happen, but it's rare. So I went through um, a year of chemo treatments. Um, I used to have to go in to have my blood checked. I used to get a, an injection the day after that was, gave you symptoms of the flu afterwards. Uh, and I was working at the time and before I had left my position, I was working in the medical field. Uh, I wasn't a doctor or anything, but, um, and I told them, my boss and his wife that I was, this is what happened, and they're very sympathetic and all. And I told them, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to schedule my chemo treatments on a Thursday because on Friday the doctor was never in. So for me to go on Thursday, and then I had the whole weekend. And they said, "Fine, fine, fine." So did that. Well, within two months after the surgery and all. I get a call from the office and they fired me yeah. and I said, why? And it was, well, the office can't, is not functioning without you. Well, I was the office manager and it was a busy practice. Not really. And so I knew the, you know, I knew this, the whole thing. And I, I said, well, what am I supposed to do? about my insurance because you know the money that you go through is unbelievable mm -hmm. and well they said well you just have to find it on your own and she hung up on me and there i am what and my daughter happened mom mom what's going on you know and so um i had to find insurance on my own which once they hear you had cancer forget mm -hmm. it forget that's it. right so i had mm -hmm. to go on Cobra insurance which very expensive. When I started mm -hmm. out, it was costing me $1,200 a month. And by the time I finished, it was 26 mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. So um, I kept saying, I can't, <laughs> I can't wait until I get on Medicare <laughs> because my insurance will really drop. It'll be newfound money, you know, that kind of thing. And I was blessed because, you know, I don't, I don't, didn't and I don't have money, but I was able to manage and get and get through. So I went through that and you go through CAT scans, you have to repeat CAT scans, blood work and all that stuff. So I tried to find a job, but I was like, who's going to hire me? 
if I have to go for a CAT scan every so often, I have to go for chemo, you know, and all this. So, you know, I just resign myself to the fact that that's not going to happen right now. So I was going along, going along. Then in 2012, I started to feel sick again. And I also have some kidney uh, issues and stuff. And of course, went to the I went to uh, the doctor and um, he made me have an, had an x-ray done, uh, a CAT scan done. And he said, Marianne, this has nothing to do with your, your kidneys. He said, you have to go see um, the doctor again. Sure enough, it came back. This time it was the size of a golf ball. But, you know, but we caught it in time. So this time I had to go for... 31 rounds of radiation and um, six months of chemo, you know, and then still go for cat skins and, and stuff like that. So it was very, you know, it was very, you know, to me, financially it was, you know, it was very tough. Um, you know, I had great support from friends, family, you know, so that got me through it. And the, um, um, a uh, uh, hospital that I had gone to, they had uh, a camp. They called it Camp Hope. This was in in Atlanta, and they sent us on a vac little mini vacation for camp. And we were, you know, we were we were the stars that day. And they did every, and that kind of helped. You know, we all found out we were in the same club. You know, some worse had some worse than other issues and stuff. So that helped. Like I said, a lot of support got me, you know, got me through it and all and, and, you know, lost my hair. And then in 2016, I got thyroid cancer. I'm like, really, you know, this, this, this can't, you know, this can't be happening, but you know, again, support and prayers. Thank God, you know, I, I got, I got through it and, you know, just decided to have a positive attitude, which is what they tell you to do to try to have that attitude and, and the support was, you know, was definitely working. And, um, you know, I too had used the Johnson and Johnson. I guess my mom used it on me because that was a big thing back then. And I continued to use it, you know, when you have your period and all, and, you know, shower to shower, fresh, you know, shower day, you know, shower day keeps the odor away and all that. Continue to use it, use it on my girls. Cause I have, I have two girls and, and Sure, you know, a lot of people did. And, um, you know, when this all happened, I was like, you know, something has to be done because this is not, this is not right. It's not fair. It's an escape that they're taking, that Johnson and Johnson is taking. You know, the rich always get richer, which, you know, you know, that kind of a thing. And for them to go into the, the bankruptcy and split in the, it's not right. It's not right because um, we're suffering. They're not suffering. You know, some of us are still suffering. Some of us, you know, we get through it. You know, it's fine. But I don't think they'll ever, they can ever understand what mental, physical, and emotional issues that we've gone through. And are, some of us still go with it, obviously, you see with me. But um, they, they just, it, it's like they drop the ball, you know, and it's like all oh, that. But, I often wonder what, if it was somebody in their families, would they feel the same way? You know, exactly. Right. And, and I mean, they have to own up to what they've done, what the what they've hidden for so many years. I mean, you know. Yes. What I was going to say is, Lee. I mean, it's a, this is just a fraction, right? Of yeah. of, of the the volume of stories and lives that, that this has affected. How do you take this, right, that, that, which I have the privilege of being a part of today, and present this to a court? Um, you know, how do you make that argument that that this, you know, this two-step that J&J is doing is just not, it's not fair, it's not just? I mean, what we've been arguing um, to both the court there in New Jersey and also to the appellate court recently is just to say almost exactly what Mariana said, maybe in a few different words, but to say to have a company like Johnson & Johnson and to put this into context, they have a better credit rating than the United States of America. 
Think about that. 500, you know, $500 billion in market capitalization. I mean, and I'll give you one more statistic because it blows me away. $30 billion in cash or the equivalent on their balance sheet. $30 billion today. And so, and, and what was the reason for the two-step? It wasn't to equitably and fairly and efficiently uh, compensate dear women like the ones on the phone today or the thousands of others. There are over, you know, I suspect there are over 50,000 present cases and probably will be 20 to 25,000 future cases. So you think of all the human suffering that's there. They don't want to compensate that fairly. What they're trying to do is to use this, quote, bankruptcy procedure to get a litigation advantage and try to be prevented from being held accountable and to delay, delay, delay. I think it was maybe Laura, I'm not sure, maybe it was you, Deborah, but you mentioned the women that have passed away every day, every day. I, I, we get calls from our clients who, from their family members because they've lost their battle with cancer. And, and I think there is a very um, sad aspect of this that really is the longer the delay, um, you know, frankly, um, there, yeah, there are a lot of, of, of women and their families who just get so tired because they're dealing with the things that we've been talking about on the phone, whether it be financial pressures or physical, you know, suffering, whatever it might be. And, you know, we haven't talked about um, all of the women who probably didn't ever get the opportunity to learn about right. who they might be able to hold accountable, right? So, so of course, it's understandable that, that Johnson & Johnson has is trying to limit their liability here. Um, one thing I'd like to, to touch on a little bit, which is I, I think that, um, that it's often forgotten is, you know, on the attorney side, I can I can talk to you all about litigation, right? But on on the plaintiff side, on the actual client side, all I've been hearing is so much, right? So much of your day, of your week, of your life is planning for doctor's visits and checkups and tests and and treatments and all of that. But now t to have that plus you're part of a litigation, there's you know mental time, there's emotional time, there's a commitment and. In some sense, it's like you know, even talking about it could be like reliving it um, over and over again. What, what, uh, like what commitment has this taken from you and your family? I mean, even just I, I have one doctor appointment in a day, and my whole afternoon is shot, right? I, I mean, it, like, how do you? It's not time get consuming. Consumed by it, yeah. It's time consuming because other diseases or other ailments that come from your body being under the toll of cancer. I personally have sarcoidosis now, so I'm on uh, cancer methotrexate, and that is used to fight cancer. And who knows if this is because of my prior cancer diagnosis, because I got cancer from Johnson & Johnson's product. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the ramifications for your whole entire family as well. My husband lives this every day, the scared, the feeling of losing me. Mm -hmm. And when we had to fill out paperwork before we even started this, when I first was with Beasley and Allen, and you had to say who was going to be the person that would be, if you were awarded money, who would be the beneficiary. I never mm -hmm. thought I would have to worry that it would not pass directly to me that it would go to somebody else because I'm not going to be here. And now as time, they're, they're dragging this so long and we've lost so many individuals. They're hoping that we go away. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that they don't have to address these issues. And I may die before I see any settlement. But And it, at first I never thought of that, how serious it is. But six years later, I've been with this band for six years trying to do this. I can see how it's starting to wear on me on the fact of thinking that this may not happen in my lifetime. And that's very, very upsetting. Mm -hmm. Very wrong. 
very it should be illegal what they're doing actually the Texas two-step never even heard of something like this you or I couldn't regroup our debt and and do something like this the not the normal everyday person but a corporate giant like Johnson and Johnson who has billions of dollars makes millions every day how are they able to do this mm -hmm. I get really upset and really passionate about it because I too, like Marianne, lost insurance right off the uh, three months after I was mm -hmm. post cancer mm -hmm. because my husband worked for a company that closed down. Mm -hmm. We could not afford Cobra. Mm -hmm. We were a young family with three little girls. We were just at our mortgage. We had were just making it. He loses his insurance. I can't afford eight hundred dollars a month for Cobra. Mm -hmm. I go for my third CA one twenty five. And I'm told at that point, unless I can pay 300 and some dollars at that very moment, I can walk out the door oh, no. because they will not draw my blood. Wow. That angers me. And when Marianne tells me this or brings that story up, it just fuels that inside of me. That is just so, it's just little, we went bankrupt, financially ruined. I could not work. And I didn't have to do the chemotherapy. I didn't have to do some of that, but it still took its toll emotionally, mm -hmm. not just physically. Mm -hmm. Deborah, how about you? Um, the t I, mean, I understand that you talked a little bit about from that first surgery and then you went back in, but how has the time and the commitment and, and the illnesses, how has it, um, changed, right? Taken, taken its toll on your life or, or changed how you live every day? Uh, it was, that was like a big major setback because once I, you know, you try to heal from one thing and then they have to go back, like back to back and be opened up again to fix stuff. It took me, I mean, a long time to recover from that. Um, for my life to be back normal, it's still not it's better than what it used to be, thank God, but it's still not normal, normal, because I'm still dealing with stuff. Um, it's just like, they call themselves a family company, but, you know, the things that they do, I'm just like appalled. You know, how can you call yourself a family company? And I would have more respect for them if they stepped up to the plate and said, you know what? We take full responsibility. We did, you know, we were sorry that some family members have lost, you know, lost loved ones, but we're going to try to make this right. And me attempt to do something. Don't just sweep it up under the rug, you know, and act like it doesn't matter. You know, act like, and don't take any responsibility for any, you know, for anything. That's a slap in the face. And, you know, I have my husband ask me every day. It's like, if I get a cold or something, or I just say, I don't feel good. I guess it just automatically takes him back to that time. He's, are you okay? You sure you're okay? He'll ask me that every day. I'm like, sometimes three or four times a day, am I okay? And it's just like, it's always in the back of your mind. You never get over it. You know, you you try to go on. I try to, like, okay, I'm still alive and breathing. I'm going, but it's still in the back of your mind. You're waiting for that one shoe to drop. You know, if you feel anything, if I feel anything, I'm thinking like, oh my God, is it, you know, has it come back? Or it just takes a mental toll on you that you never quite get over. I, I feel this uh, the same way because, you know, every you have to still go for your CA-125 test. And I mean, making that appointment, yeah, I got to do it. But waiting to get to the doctor's office and then waiting for the results. I mean, you know, and even though the doctor assures you you're okay, you're, you're not okay because... It could come back less me. It did. It came back in me, you know, but st even though it was a while ago, I still had that fear, you know? So I pray, you know, I'm like, oh God, please, please, please. And then you have to wait for about a week to get the results. And it's, it's, it blows your mind. It, it really, really blows your mind. And for, you know, for, for Johnson and Johnson to do this bankruptcy ploy, I mean, I always thought bankruptcy, is to help a company or, or people that don't really have money and to help them get back on their feet. You know, like you said, $500 billion they have. 
it, 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 it's not right. You know, it's like, they're, you know, they're playing with us. It's like a game to them, but it's not a game to us. You know, we don't want to be part of that game. You know, just man up, take your responsibility and help us with this. Admit you did wrong. Yeah. You know, that part yes. of what um, I, I, mean, the, I think Deborah and Marianne, you both agree and Laura, you too, that taking if, mm-hmm. if Johnson and Johnson were to take responsibility or admit that that's part of what you're looking for right. is, is, yes. is that admission. Um, and, and so often I think, uh, you know, the corporate on the corporate side that you lose sight of the fact that on the other side, it's people, not pawns. That's right. right. Yes. Um, right. And it's, yeah. uh, you know, and it's that, your profits over people. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's one of the, the critical aspects of this too, that um, in this quote bankruptcy two step, it's, it's, taken away the ability of women, you know, like Marianne, like Deborah, like Laura, to be able to present their case to a jury if Johnson and Johnson won't take responsibility to have a jury find that they're liable. And that that right is guaranteed by the Constitution, the Seventh Amendment. And that's one of the really important things that we are fighting to preserve here because they have essentially tried to um, you know, prevent you from exercising that right, because because Marianne nailed it. What bankruptcy is for is that honest debtor who finds himself in a in a fortunate situation, and it gives that debtor a break in order to reorganize himself to try to continue. But that's not what we're dealing with. Johnson and Johnson, by using this small little sham subsidiary, has been able to continue their business unfettered by any accountability, any oversight of the bankruptcy court. And that's one of the most egregious things about it. And that's why we're fighting in the third circuit to say, this is wrong. This is not the, this is violates the bankruptcy code. It's bad faith. And they did this only for litigation advantage. We're arguing it there. And we've also been urging Congress and, and members of both the Senate and the House of Representatives are looking at this because they too feel that this is a violation of the bankruptcy code and it should be you know, prevented. And so there's legislation that's being considered for that purpose. And we're, you know, urging them to take that step because any company who has a liability um, would be tempted to do this if this is allowed. Any company. Right. And that would be right. It it has effects beyond just this litigation. And it's so, it's so interesting. I mean, and I've heard this before, right, but you, you talk about uh, an honest debtor and seeking justice and mm-hmm. just thinking about what's happening, you know, something doesn't seem quite right. Um, so, so Leo, I might have to invite you back to talk more about sure. um, the actual uh, legal arguments at some point. Um, but I, I want to do something just because as I'm sitting here and listening to y'all, I'm thinking I have a lot running through my head and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not an unbiased <laughs> um, interviewer just because this has affected my family. Um, by the way, Marianne, my mom was a medical office manager too. So I'm feeling a lot oh. of, I'm feeling a lot of um, um, similarities here. This is kismet connection. in some way. Right, right. Um, but that was back when I was in middle school. Um, I'm not in middle school anymore, even though I'd love, well, no, not middle school. High school <laughs> um, that was many years ago. And I'm thinking of all of the beautiful, amazing things that my mom's done over those years. Um, all of the joy she's brought to everyone's life. And so oh. um, there's a reason oh. why you're here. Yeah. And there's a reason why you're here. here. Yeah. Um, so I want to spin this a little bit and, and I want to end uh, on a positive note. Tell me about, you know, something you do or some new way that you, that you look at life and how this um, illness, right? Illnesses, how, how cancer has helped you enjoy things more or, or something positive. I'm a silver lining kind of person. I always try to spin things and maybe you tell me there's nothing, you know, don't ask that question, but is there something that. I will start if you don't, um, I spin it in the way of live every moment to the best and the fullest ability of your being, be yourself, be me, be my authentic person that I am. Stand up for what I believe in. Um, and it, it has given me that, that strength. I'm a fighter. We all are. We're here for a reason. I will not take this lying down. To the last breath in me, I will fight. And that is where I'm at. 
That is how I feel. Well, that is what I'm talking about. Um, and please, please invite me to the victory party. Yay. <laughs> you will know. You know, I know it's a big fun. one. Yeah, Deborah. For me, um, when I found out when I was diagnosed, the first, you know, when you hear the word cancer, the first thing people think about, oh, oh my God, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Because you know, for some, it depends on what type it is. Is you know, usually death behind it. But I remember the doctor telling me, and I looked at, it, I said, well, okay, this is where we are. How do we treat it? How do we get rid of it? I said, because if it's not permanent, we're gonna, you know, tell me what I need to do to get behind, you know, get this behind me and get rid of it. You know, I didn't think like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I was just like, okay, we got a fight on our hands. Let's, let's go for it. And, you know, when she told me, I just like, I just kept a positive attitude, you know, mm -hmm. and prayed about this stuff and made it through this. So now I'm just like living, like they said, leave, leave, live each day like it's your last. I just stay in the moment of stuff. I enjoy myself. I said, I'm not going to let this, even though the stuff stays in the back of my head, I said, I'm not going to let that get me down. I'm going to, you know, live life, do things that, you know, that back then, you know, you didn't really think about it. And if things look like a whole, whole lot different. you like, wow, why didn't I, you know, ever do this before? Or why didn't I ever stop and take time? I stop and take time to do that. Enjoy my grandkids, you know, and they keep me going. So I said, I'm just going to fight, fight, fight and keep living. That's how I see it. Yeah, it's uh it's like a rude awakening. I think you you value your life more and the life of others more because of what we've been through. Um, you know, and to try to you know to keep that positivity going and to encourage others who are going through it, you know, sometimes it, whether it's breast cancer, you know, calling whatever, just to try I you know myself try to be encouraging to them. I mean, because what I went through, um, you know, pe what I tell people, you know, you know, I had it twice and, and they're shocked and they say, well, how do you do it? I said, well, I try to keep that positive attitude and do life differently. And the little things don't matter anymore because, you know, all of us, we've come pretty close there, you know, to, you know, but, um, I think that's for me, that's, that's the key. You know, I try to encourage people if I find, you know, I, 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 when I find out some women are, you know, all oh, finishing chemo and, and I always try to introduce myself and whatever, and just to let them know that there's somebody else who has gone through the same thing. We yes. know, you know, mm -hmm. and just to encourage people, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. You know, yes. you have days that you don't want to get up, you know, yes. and mm -hmm. talk to me, I don't want to, but you will get through it. And I think that's, that's what we need to do is encourage, and encourage people and, you know, just live life to the fullest, you know, cause we don't know when we're going to not be here anymore, you know, that kind that's of thing. Right, yeah. So it sounds to me like each of you has become the woman that you needed at that moment when you found out, um, yeah. what do you wish someone was there to say to you? when you discovered that you had cancer or at, at that moment when you didn't want to get out of bed, um, what would you tell your then self? Yeah. Um, you know, get up, do something, get your mind occupied on something else and just sit in there. And then, cause you can't add anything by worrying. You only make yourself, you know, more sick or worse. So mm -hmm. you don't feel like getting up, but get up anyway and do something. Yeah. You know, keep your mind on, get your mind on something else and, and motivate yourself. Yeah. yeah. Put on that makeup yeah. and put on that fancy yeah. dress and, you know, let that people laugh hair. at you, you know, that kind of a thing. It's, but that's what you have to do. You have to have, you know, go, you know, go back to the way your life was as much as you can mm -hmm. before this affected your life. You know, yeah. and mm -hmm. the person who you are, yeah. you know, just love. I think you have to fake it, fake it to make it is what I call it. <laughs> Some days, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Lee yeah. probably has oh, yeah. too. Absolutely. Um, let me um, sincerely thank each of you for spending the time here today. Lee, you too. Um, I'm sure there are days that are harder than others and days that are easier, but um, you have absolutely made my day by speaking to me, by spending the time, by sharing. Um, and I 
will do whatever I can to help uh, share your stories. Um, I know it's not always easy, but there will be, and if there's only one person, only one woman who sees this interview and get, makes an appointment or actually goes to check on um, you know, why yeah. she's been feeling nauseous or something, you will have made a difference. And so thank, thank you, you with all that you've got on your plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. for doing that. And I must also say thank you to your family members, mm -hmm. um, oh. to your husband and children and everyone, because they are a, a big part of it mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, it's, They're my uh, rock. They're on, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. for the whole family, but um, yeah. oh. what, a, you know, what, a, what a beautiful morning. Yeah. It's I, been. And thank, thank you, you Lee, um, um, for what yeah. your, you and Beasley Allen are doing for us and fighting for yes. us. You know, it's it's yes. you know, it's very much appreciated. You know, and it's kind of not neat to me, you know, to see you. Yes. <laughs> you know that yes. kind of thing. We get the letters or whatever, but you know, yeah. just to, you know, just to know that that you you know you're all fighting for us. You know, and it's yes. very much appreciated. Well, very much. Yeah. Well, you three are. Yeah. Uh, if I could say thank you for one having us on, Elisa, and letting us all share yeah. and. I just yep. want to say, Marianne, Laura, Deborah, you are living beautiful lives of grace, uh, enduring yeah. suffering. And uh, for, for me and all of us here at Beasley Allen to be your advocates is one of the privileges and blessings of my life. I am so Thank honored. You. And uh, you're gonna make me cry. Yeah, it's an honor. <laughs> I'm already crying. So, well, I <laughs> know. God bless you. I was going to say, Lee, before you before yeah. you said it, like a lot of times you'll see plaintiffs' attorneys spoken about uh, in a different light, mm. right? That it's yeah. all about the money. <laughs> it's not, it's, Lee. This is this is exactly what I know drives yeah. you and and Beasley Allen and and other uh, plaintiffs' lawyers too. Right. Um, this is an open invitation that, that each of you or all of you are welcome back anytime. Please, thank you. Um, if you ever just want to talk or chit chat. Um, share your story. Um, another uh, challenge that you've gone through, Lee. I'm going to follow you wow. <laughs> in the non-creepy way. Um, but, ladies, thank you so much. Your strength is unbelievable and unwavering, and we are all better people for it. <laughs>